What is up, everybody? Eddie Barco here, and welcome to the Nebula Music Podcast. This is a show where I interview some of today's most inspiring and influential musicians with the goal of exploring their mindset and really trying to figure out what makes them tick. Today, I'm joined by none other than Joey Dosick, a very talented musician, singer, songwriter, is pretty much heavily involved in everything, and I am so honored to have this guy on the show. If you've never heard of him, you have definitely heard some of his music on Spotify. He's on so many different playlists. His music is playing all over the world. But a lot of you guys may actually recognize him from his work with Volpec and all of those guys in that scene. This is definitely a milestone for me because I respect him as a musician, as a fellow creator. I respect this man's mindset. And I was truly amazed to find out how detailed he is about his songwriting and how he approaches music. And it's definitely a conversation that I'm excited to share with all of you. There is no way that I could do justice to Joey's full story and the way he approaches music. So why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and just jump in straight to the conversation because I'm excited to share it with you guys. All right. What is up, everybody? Eddie Barco here with the Nebula Music Podcast. And I'm very excited because I have someone that I'm a big fan of, that I have been a very big fan of for a very long time. I've seen you play live many times, man, with many people that I love. And the fact that I get a chance to have you, I, basically to get a chance to talk to you in person, it's it's a dream come true for me. And I know it's a dream come true for a lot of my fans, but I don't want to waste any time because I have Joey Dosick joining me on the interview. Joey, how are you today, man? Hey, man. Thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. Pleasure to be on the pod. Man, you know what? They should be kinder because I think you're literally one of the most talented singer-songwriters I've seen live in a very long time. I could watch you play piano and sing. And, and I'm not even piano. You can play so many other instruments. I can watch you just perform for so long. And to me, it's it's amazing all the things that you can do. How'd you get so talented, man? I <laughs> know it's a hard <laughs> question, but how'd, how oh do you do God, it? Oh, my God. Stop it. Um, <laughs> uh Man, I don't know. You know, I honestly, I, I think, I don't know, from my, from my point of view, like I'm always just trying to get better. And uh, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, where I stand. I mean, obviously, I, I started on, I started on piano. Um, I started playing the saxophone um, and, and uh, then kind of gravitated back to piano and singing, which was always kind of my, my first love. And, uh, yeah. and since then, still kind of like I love picking up other instruments. I love um, kind of diving into being a rhythm section player. I love, I love it all. So it's kind of like for me, it's just kind of about trying to get better every day. Yeah, I feel like all the greats, all the legends always have a very similar answer. You guys are always trying to just improve. And that's why you continue to stay at the top of your game. And I find that really fascinating because for those of you guys who might not know, and I'll go ahead and let Joey uh, explain his, you know, his story in a second. But, you know, Joey is a fantastic solo artist, writes amazing music. And I have a sweet spot for songwriters. Even though I'm a drummer and I come from a jazz background, I love a good songwriter. And that's why I love what you do, Joey. But Joey, you play with a lot of really great people too. And I think a lot of people will recognize you from a lot of like the Volpick videos and the stuff like you've played with Corey Wong and all those guys. So you're a very well-versed artist. And in order to play with the greats, you have to be really good yourself, which is why I give you kind words because you deserve it, my man. But I want to go ahead and just sort of like, I don't know, maybe Tell me a little bit about how you started specifically with music. I know you said that you sort of gravitated from piano to saxophone, but maybe like where are you from and kind of sort of what started your interest with music, if that's okay? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I'm from Los Angeles, California. Nice. And uh, I grew up um, with parents that were not in the music business, but or musicians really. My, my dad, my dad um, loved to sing opera, but he did it. Um, really sort of for fun yeah and so I grew up around a lot of classical music um because he's a big fan of that and I grew up around uh listening to my my parents music from their childhood like the Beatles and Elvis and Motown music and um that that kind of thing Sam Cooke um yeah. Carole King and so I kind of grew up around that and then also you know, just being a, a kid growing up in the 90s, listening to pop radio and listening to um, 
you know, Notorious B.I.G. and listening to <laughs> yes. um, In Sync, you know, like just really just typical stuff. And um, I started playing piano when I was five because my sister was having uh, piano lessons and I was jealous and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and I just kind of I just kind of had a proclivity for music in, in whatever way or a uh, um, a sort of joy with music, I think really is really what it is. I, you know, I think, I think people do have proclivities towards certain things, you know, it's, right. it's always so crazy to see, Oh, this kid, he just really gravitated towards the crayons or he really gravitated towards uh, the, like soccer or whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, I, I gravitated toward, uh, music, uh, as well as sports, but music, uh, mostly I think it's just cause I just felt joy, um, plan in playing um and so yeah i i and i always loved to sing and uh, i i kind of always did that as a kid um but then let's see when i was around 10 years old i started playing the saxophone uh in band at school and i i got really into the saxophone and i got uh, exposed to jazz through some great teachers and got exposed yeah. to John Coltrane and got exposed yeah, nice. to Miles Davis and Ornette Coleman and, and, and kind of went deep into that world, which really spoke to me and, uh, I ended up going to, um, school on a saxophone scholarship, kind of like really dedicated towards, um, jazz music and, and that, that place, but, you know, always kind of at the, core of who I am was always songs and singing and piano. I always loved playing piano. And nice. midway through being in school, I uh, kind of went back towards, uh, you know, I was like, am I really going to be a saxophone player my whole life? Is that what I'm trying to do? And, you know, the thing that um, always kind of resonated most with me was to sing and to play and uh, to r try and write a good song. And so, I kind of gravitated back towards that thing, which brings me the most joy. And since then, I've been just trying to write a good song and trying to learn what it takes to make a good record and produce a good record. And, and that's still the, the quest that I'll probably be following uh, for the rest of my life. And that's kind of where I am now. As you should, man. I mean, that's probably, it's your calling. If there is such a thing as a calling, that's definitely for sure what I think you're testing to do. I'm curious, where did you go to, where did you go to school? Did you go here in LA or did you go somewhere else? I went to the University of Michigan in oh, Ann Arbor. That's right, yeah. Um, and, uh, which is pretty random from <laughs> being like a kid from LA. I, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but they offered me a scholarship and there was some teachers that I thought were cool and you know, I it, I was so lucky to go there because I ended up meeting um, a great deal of like the music community yeah. um, that uh, I, just, I I still collaborate with today. Yeah, and it's interesting because it is a very in interesting choice to go from L.A. to to Michigan because I feel like a lot of people either go to L.A. or New York or sometimes even Nashville for to study. But I know right. for you specifically, and even like Corey, we were talking about how in the Midwest uh, in that other states in that area there's a lot of big music communities that a lot of us from la because i'm la born and raised too don't normally get exposed to and what i'm curious right. about is what was the what do you see like the big difference or maybe it's changed but at the time did you see an immediate difference between the musicians here in la and the ones that you met in michigan definitely i mean definitely first first of all um i mean i think you also bring up a good point as far as you know, especially if there are a lot of people listening to your podcast that um, are aspiring musicians. You know, I, I think yeah, you don't need to go necessarily to L.A. New York, or New York just like right off the bat or just right. be like, you know, it's I think um, as far as the music industry and work, there is a lot of potential work in Los Angeles and New York. And that's something to aspire to. But um you know, it's not to say that you can't like juice uh, the most out of your opportunity in a way. True. And, um, you know, I, I would be lying, too, if I said that I didn't get I don't that I didn't feel like I got lucky in going to me in going to Michigan and meeting this sort of. Um, I mean, Michigan, in a way, is a, is a really transient play, uh, town Ann Arbor, Michigan, because it's a college town. And so. Huh. You do have people who are from Ann Arbor, but you also have people who are kind of like coming in and out 
for school. So interesting. The, some of the people that um, I met were from Ann Arbor, but then some of them were just going to school there. Like um, I met all the Wolfpack guys in Michigan. And so, yeah. um, you know, you have Theo, who's from New York. You have Jack, who's from Cleveland. You have Joe, who's from northern Michigan. You have Woody, who's from Chicago. Um, so uh, a, a town like that, a college town, you know, you have people coming from all over. And I guess the difference between, you know, that and Los Angeles is in Los Angeles, um, in growing up, I actually knew a lot of people who were from L.A. who um, had sort of grown up around here. And, you know, there's so many music resources here in, right. in, in this city. They're sort and, of built uh, in to the way the city works. In a way, yeah, I think so. I mean, and uh, one one simple answer, too, is there's just – there was just a great, greater amount of diversity here in Los Angeles. Yeah. So you're kind of getting exposed to, uh, you know, if you're open to it and you seek it out, you can get exposed to many different cultures. You can get exposed to many different styles of music, um, traditions of music. And with it, with, even within this city, which is pretty segregated. Um, so you have to sort of go out and seek out all of those op- opportunities. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Ann Arbor, Michigan, I didn't really know what to expect except the college town. But then you're also in close proximity to, to D- Detroit and there's yeah. a scene there. And, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Corey had a lot to say about Minneapolis. I mean, Minneapolis, you show up in Minneapolis and, and go out to the Bunkers Jam with Corey and you see some of the some of the funkiest people in the world. So it's, you know, I, I, if you, if you're listening to this podcast and, and you're living in Northern Michigan, which is a, you know, a pretty unpopulated place, um, or something like that, you might, yeah, you, you might need to venture out a little bit to find some other musicians, but it's not to say that it's just like, you know, you, you need to, immediately pack your bags and go to LA or New York because right. it's also important that like you work on your craft. And when you do get to a city like LA or New York, that, you know, you have some of your skills together in order to kind of be able to, um, transform it into something else. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting. I- I'm glad you say that because this is something that I'm curious about you specifically is it seems to me like right now, uh, well, maybe let me backtrack a little bit. L.A. and like we were talking about, L.A. and New York has always sort of been the hot spot for work and where entertainment sort of lives to some degree. But right now I'm seeing personally me as a drummer and born and raised in L.A. and doing the whole L.A. thing for my whole life. What I'm seeing is there's this huge sort of influx of outside musicians that have all sort of come out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like they've kind of come out of nowhere, Mm -hmm. but sort of are changing the way the industry is. And you're uh, you're in that wave. I mean, you're from LA, so you're sort of a you're sort of a hybrid. You left, but in my opinion, I think you leaving and going somewhere like Michigan, that was close to Detroit, exposed you to a different sort of side of the music that allowed you to create your own unique version and then come back and be able to essentially change everything. And so. I don't know, like, I feel like that might be the key to do something unique. Like, do you feel like that's something that a lot of musicians are doing right now? A lot of, like, the people that go outside of the usual hotspots are sort of changing the way everything is? Mm. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think a lot of, a lot of people come to L.A. Um, because there's more work here for music. Right. You know, this is, this is kind of where it's popping off. But in general, you know, I think, um, you know, it's all about it's all about the the story that we, that we tell through our music. And yeah. for some people, that story is one that is fully about the place where they were born and raised and never left. And that could be a beautiful story. And for some other people, it's about, you know, the road that they traveled playing and touring their music and, or, or just, you know, taking a chance and going and spending six months in Brazil or, or going and, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was very lucky to get exposed um, to to an, a different scene besides the one I I uh, besides the one that I grew up in, you know. It, and I'm sure, besides the fact that I just got to meet a bunch of people and uh, who became lifelong friends, I also kind of 
you know, it's, it was my college years. So I got, it, it was like my most, you know, my formative years, as they say, it's like, yeah, you know, I, uh, I really kind of, uh, found out more about who I am through leaving, uh, Los Angeles. I love that, man. I love that you were able to sort of discover something new. What are the differences or like the musical, what are some of the musical things that you feel like you learned out near Detroit in, um, Michigan, where you went, like, what do you feel are some of the like unique musical styles that you were exposed to that allowed you to sort of create your own unique style that you brought back home, essentially? Well, I, to be honest, so much of it was like, was just like jamming with friends, you know, so much of it was sort of like these kind of jams we would have in the basement at parties and stuff like, or just being being like a being a party band almost you know it's like <laughs> it's um like playing we played a, a bunch of gigs out some of them were like some of them looking back were pretty horrendous like we would play <laughs> these like essentially like frat parties you know um like there'd be these parties that we'd have at our house which were really really fun and great and um they would yeah they would always sort of like evolve to these jams in the basement um uh, but between, you know, that and, you know, playing, playing these frat parties too, it's like, uh, it's sort of where I feel like I learned, um, how to, I guess the right word would be to entertain, you know, it's like, interesting it, in general, like, you know, I get a lot of joy out of, uh, pleasing an audience, like. As you should. Um, <laughs> As you I, I do. Of course. You know, it's it's, and I I don't think it's I don't think it's a negative thing at all. It's like I get joy out of like bringing joy to other people, and so that's not to say that I'm not like I don't say you should. I don't think you should deny. I'm not denying my own musical voice. It's like how do you merge those things? And to be that was a great experience for me to just kind of be at parties and just be like, <laughs> okay, like you know. You need to get. You need to make the crowd feel good, and it's like that's still something that is like so at the core of what I'm trying to do now as an artist, um, and what brings me great joy is to just like go and play shows. Um, we just finished the tour, and that's you just right, feel yeah. like okay, I'm 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 playing in Brussels. I've never played in Brussels before, but I want to make sure that like people leave with you know, their eyes glazed over and a huge smile on their face. And so I think that was, you know, that's, that's very much like the best education that I could have gotten in a college town beyond yeah. just like, beyond just, you know, a class on counterpoint. It's like, <laughs> there really should be a class on like getting a crowd off. There should be a class on like making people dance. Yeah. Um, because that's sort of a, a big part of the mu musical education that I feel like is ignored, you know? Yeah. Um, so well, part they, of me wonders, teach you, sorry, part of me wonders you if that's something that you can actually teach though. Do you feel like that's something you can, you have to sort of learn hands on? Oh yeah. I think you could teach it. I think it's, I, I definitely think you could teach it. It's like, I don't think you should be able to graduate from jazz school if you can't play like three simple beats on the drums. You know, it's like, but yeah, I love that. You yes. know, I never, I never learned how to do that stuff in school. Like I had to, I had to get with my friends that, uh, you know, played the drums to teach me how to just play like a simple money making beat, you know, or it's like, you should, you should have to do that kind of stuff. I think I, it's, 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 a. Uh, I mean, in the end, it's like, it's, it's not serving it's not serving your students if the, if they don't, you know, understand that because ja that's where jazz comes from anyway. You know, yeah. it's, it's like jazz comes from making people dance. And so, uh, you know, I still sometimes I still like am afraid to dance as a human. <laughs> like and that shouldn't be it's like you, there should be dancing classes like we should have we should have. I, I feel like that that takes precedent over like learning poinciana in all 12 keys it's like i i would i i if i could go back and create a curriculum would be like okay everybody's gonna dance everybody's gonna learn three <laughs> drum beats <laughs> and yes, and I we're also that. gonna and we're also gonna talk about like we're also gonna talk about how to manage your finances you know it's like that's basically <laughs> yes. like what's missing from jazz school 
Oh my God, man! You're 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 criticizing everything that I I always talk about in, in a very in a much more polite way, and I appreciate that you're bringing it up that way. I'm I'm here's the thing: like I absolutely agree with you, and part of my story is I do come from a jazz background myself too, and I remember when I first started playing uh, with a singer songwriter, one of the first funny criticisms I got was that I played way too much. You know, like I had way too many ghost notes going on, way too many fills. And it was funny at first, but I remembered when the light bulb went off, I finally just played a solid, just like a laid back beat to an audience and everything sounded so perfect and tight. It clicked for me. You know what I mean? Like I felt it. I felt that moment where I realized why it was important to just play what I needed because that vibe or that energy I was getting from the audience it was just way more important than me playing super fast. You know what I mean? Right. And a part right. of me, part of me wonders if you felt that at any specific moment, like if you, did you go into school sort of with that open mind or did you sort of approach music kind of like I did? And I'll be honest, I felt, I feel like a, like an asshole now talking about the past, how I used to be like that. But part of me wonders if that, if that lesson, if you learned it sort of on the spot or if you never had that problem that I had, you know what oh, I mean? No. Especially as a jazz musician. I feel like I'm still learning that lesson. You know, I feel like, um, I feel like I still, uh, record and listen back and I'm like, Oh yeah, I just, I need to play a third of those notes. You know, I, I think that's, I think that's a, that's a process that for me keeps evolving. Um, and I mean, when I went to music school, I was, I was really, really focused on, I, on the saxophone. I was really uh, focused on like, I don't know, this sort of aesthetic of, uh, like mid to late sixties, uh, John Coltrane, uh, Eric Dolphy, Ornette Coleman, Albert Eiler. Like I was, I was so, you know, in in that realm, like I played a, like a shit ton of notes. Um, (laughs) and, uh, you know, it, it's, it was almost like, you know, Coltrane developed this whole like sheets of sound thing and he was exploring all the time and, and, uh, you know, making all, using his instrument to try and make sounds that no one had ever made before. And so that was sort of the, you know, that was sort of the quest that I was on. I, I don't think, and listen, there, there are musicians that play a ton of notes that I, that I think, that I think it's great. Like, I, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I just think like, um, for me and, and what I'm trying to get at now I'm so appreciative over, you know, what it means to like, just play the snare on two and four or whatever. It's like that to me is that to me becomes like, you know, something, something wonderful and like the building blocks of music in general. Um, So, yeah, I, I mean, as far as playing less, like that's, it's, that's just like a quest. Like if you weren't a studio musician, just growing up in studios playing by the time you were 14 or 15. Like, I I think, I think that's something everyone needs to think about when they record probably if they're, if they're making pop music. Does that lesson or do those lessons ever translate into your songwriting? Like the the Uh, fact of just sort of focusing on the simplicity, not not necessarily simplicity because your music, like I said, I have a, I love singer songwriters and I love what you guys can do. I think primarily because I don't really consider myself one. I'm not very good at writing songs, but for you specifically, I love listening to your songs and there's an energy that is with your style that I wouldn't describe it as like in your face, you know, but I can definitely see where your passion and where your emotions are when with all the words and the music that you write. So what I'm curious about with all the lessons that we've sort of been talking about, sort of your process of what you learned, I'm curious, like, did any of those lessons sort of translate over when you were starting to write music? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe the answer um, in terms of song is sort of um, simplifying form because I spent a long time when I first wrote songs, sort of just being like maybe a bit too fancy, you know, and mm. I still, I still can get kind of fancy in my writing. And, uh, I, uh, I don't think there's, you know, that can be great sometimes, but of course I'm, it can. I'm, uh, I did, I did learn a lot sort of being, uh, more open towards, uh, traditional song forms. And, uh, I went from the first songs that I wrote having like, 
you know, the A section into the B section into into the <laughs> into the C section with the one time event into the chorus that goes into the the bridge that does before a second verse that you know whatever. And um, you know, once I sort of uh, I don't know, once I sort of tried to just be like, okay, like you have a great nugget of an idea here. How 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 could this what what if this is uh like for instance okay i i have a song called game winner and then yep. game winner which kind of is a song that i wrote about basketball it's sort of a basket it's a or using basketball as a metaphor um it's a basketball love song and so i love it great had, song by the way thank you thank you and so i had a i had a great a great idea there and i wrote the song and was recording the song and uh originally it had a first verse and the first verse went into the chorus and the chorus went straight to the bridge and then the bridge came out and went into the last chorus. And so, uh, it's sort of a, like the first verse was really long. So it felt, it felt like, okay. I was like, okay, this is weird, but that's okay. And in the end, or excuse me, I'm forgetting that there is a pre-chorus in there somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> it's not important. You can listen to the song and hear it yourself. In fact, the, what I'm describing, because Wolfpack recorded a version of the song too, is the, the version that they recorded is closer to what I had originally written. Um, and so, yeah, so on my version, basically I played it for my friend Maki, who I've uh, collaborated with on a bunch of songs. And he was like, this is great. Like, why don't you have a second verse in the song? And I was like, yeah, why, why don't I have a second verse in the song? <laughs> you know, it's like, it was almost like I, I had been lazy or something. So I went back and wrote a second verse and it made it feel like a, a and I'm using air quotes right now. It made it feel like a song, you know, <laughs> um, like, so that's maybe like one example of, uh, you know, just simplicity. Maybe that's the like playing less. It's like, yeah, you know, you don't like try, try looking at a song like a Sam Cooke song and looking at the form and then writing a song in that form or becoming more familiar with these kind of forms that have always uh, worked somehow. So maybe, maybe that's the songwriting version of that. I hope I didn't, didn't blabber on too no, long. No, no, that, that was perfect. And I love, I love hearing you explain your songwriting process because, again, I'm fascinated by that. And I think there's a lot of songwriters that, uh, that listen to the show that are also looking to improve their, their style or their, their technique. But one of the things that I, I'm curious for you, because I play piano a bit myself too, coming from a jazz background, I had to understand a little bit how it works. And I know plenty of other pianists too that are just phenomenal. But for you, your songs, right? If I didn't know any better, right? Like I can clearly tell from listening to your music that you know what you're doing, but I wouldn't peg you as like, you know, like a great jazz player. And I don't mean to, to, to offend by any means, but I know that you are a great musician yourself. My question, or I'm, what I'm curious about is, when you started writing your music or learning how to write a great song, did your knowledge sort of clash with your ability to write? And let me explain a bit. Sometimes as a pianist, I know that I specifically can get very carried away with all the voicings that I do. You know, I want to make the biggest chords that I can. But sometimes when you're writing a song, it obviously depends on the song. Sometimes it doesn't require that. Sometimes just a simple triad, you know, with maybe a seventh is what you need to drive a song. And when you listen to most pop songs, most singer songwriter stuff, it tends to be that way. And so I'm curious for you, like when you first started in, in your in your songwriting adventures and doing the stuff that you're doing now, did that ever clash with all that knowledge you gained musically wise? If that makes any sense? Um, I, I mean, and I think it does. I think, uh, and obviously everybody, I, everybody's different, you know, like yeah. obviously some people use it to their advantage, but I'm curious for you, like if that ever helped or, or hurt it in any specific way. I don't think it ever really hurt because I, I think in general, like I, I've amassed more knowledge as I've gotten older. So like, I, I think uh, it's just a matter of kind of being able to filter yourself in the right way. Um, a lot of songwriting for me has always been uh, imitation you know, and mm. imitation has to do with, you know, what you're studying and what you're listening to and what's filtering in. So when I first started writing songs, I was trying to make this transition from 
being mainly a saxophone player into mainly a piano player, which is my first instrument. And so what I had to do is I had to learn how to voice chords in a way that sounded like all my favorite records. So I just kind of mm. dove into all of Stevie Wonder's catalog, basically, and was like, okay, what are these songs? What are the chords? You know, And in doing that, I learned all these voicings that I had never knew what they were, um, but I, I was familiar with the sound. And so you start to incorporate those new chords into your own music. And, uh, you know, that's, that's still a, a process that I, that I do now. It's like through listening, through listening to music, um, like for instance, like something that's, I'll give you an example of something that I'm interested in, in working on right now. Um, the, the other day, this Ashanti song came on the radio, <laughs> nice. which I hadn't heard in a long time. It's the one that's, it's, I, I think it's a, it might be a DeBarge sample. The one that's like, do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah. And it's like, my what a days great song. Home without you. you know, do, do. So that song, um, which I hadn't heard since I was in like high school or something. And so I was listening to this song and I'm like, this song is a is a masterclass on writing a million melodies over one beat because it's yeah. just a it's just like a straight loop, you know, pretty much like the the it's just like one chord progression, one thing. And so I'm like that's that's a great that's that's a perfect challenge for me as someone who has written a bunch of songs that have um different sections and whatever. It's like you know what, that's, that's, that's something that I need to dig into. So, um, you know, the, the challenge then for me becomes just like coming up with something that kind of imitates, not necessarily like that exact Ashanti beat, but just sort of like, it's something that I can then write over. That's just one thing, you know? So it's, it's, I think for me, it's a, the process has always just been like study and and then apply it to me and see if I can sort of use my own voice, my own ear to filter it into something that I like to play. Yeah. And, and that you actually finish because so many songs don't even get finished. <laughs> I completely agree. There's so many. So especially as, as a musician, sometimes even when you just mess around with music, you never get a chance to finish it. And what a great example with the whole Ashanti thing. I completely forgot about that song, but it's a great, great song and a great pop tune that, for that. Like I, what I'm curious about is you since you were talking about your saxophone experience and how essentially that's what you studied and you transferred a lot of that knowledge over to the piano and, and what you're doing now. Um, what I'm curious about is saxophone and piano is a very interesting combination for me, at least I think, uh, well, yeah, I think it's a very interesting combination and it's a, I'm not, I don't want to say more rhythmic because piano is very rhythmic. I can, in fact, it's probably one of the most rhythmic instruments out there. What I'm curious about is in your songwriting or when you first started transitioning your 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 knowledge from saxophone to piano, do you feel like or what elements of the saxophone of being a saxophonist sort of transferred over into being a pianist? Because I'm not a saxophonist at all. Obviously, I've heard and played with saxophonists, but I don't know anything about playing that instrument. I'm curious for you. I think it helped you be unique in that sense. And I'm curious for you, if you like, if you were able to sort of pinpoint some of the things that you were able to bring over from playing a wind instrument to the piano. Interesting. I, I think it, I think the thing that it mainly influenced was probably more my singing, uh, because, ah, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's a saxophone is a melody instrument. It's right. a top line instrument, you know? And so, um, I, I started as a piano player and I was really, I was always really good at theory. Um, and so when I, when I play saxophone, when I did play saxophone and when I do, I usually mostly see piano shapes in my brain. Um, I sort of see it, the things that I play as displayed on a piano versus like displayed on, you know, I don't know what, you know, seeing saxophone shapes of like, fingerings and and uh you know embouchure or whatever it, it would be so uh i i'm not i'm not really sure exactly how saxophone would have filtered into the piano playing i think mostly it filtered just into you know into melody so i guess in a way 
if I was going to say piano, I would just say like, you know, in voice leading the top voice, like in huh. just kind of like helping me uh, just hear that top voice. But I, I've, I had a lot of work to do and, and I still uh, am, am uh, into studying what it means to be a rhythm section player because as a saxophone player, you, you just kind of like play the melody. Uh, you know, you wait for the trumpet player to finish his solo. Then you come on and, and you play, play your solo and then you chill. So it's like but the <laughs> piano player is just like is has to be, you know, supportive. It's got to be that supportive role. And uh, it, it's it's a whole other skill set. Yeah, I love that. I love how you were able to transition that knowledge into playing the piano. And I think it personally, I think it shows a lot in your music. And what I what I was curious about is, OK, so you basically transition your knowledge for that top line. One of the things that you mentioned a little earlier, which I was very fascinated by, and this is something that I th- I want to learn more about like like lead singers and people that do what you do songwriters people that know how to entertain with just their instrument me as a drummer you know i can sit there and play solos for hours and and whatever but for the most part i would argue that a lot of people consider the drums as part of a unit as it should be you know we're a rhythm section we play for a band uh, and then we have our moments to shine but that's that's normally what the drummers do and i'm okay with that but what i'm fascinated by is people like you like legendary songwriters that can sit up there play the piano and keep an audience, a massive audience engaged on your voice, on what you're playing. I I know you were talking about before how in the frat parties you guys were jamming and doing all of that. And that sort of helped you guys understand how to keep an audience engaged, how to like, how to keep that whole thing going, that energy going. How do you translate that into being a solo artist like yourself? Because I know you play with a band and all that stuff, but sometimes I've seen you perform just by yourself. And I personally, uh, just me speaking for myself, I'd be intimidated to go out there with just a piano and my voice, but you do it so well. So I'm curious, like, how did you learn to keep an audience engaged? Or how do you keep an audience engaged just with you in the keys, if that makes sense? And maybe I mean, it's a broad question. Maybe it's like a super broad, like it, it depends. But I'm curious for you specifically if you have a thought on it, if you have any specific way, or if you just kind of go on autopilot, if that makes sense. Well, I, right. Maybe, I mean, uh, autopilot's a funny word because autopilot to me that means like, it can mean two things. Autopilot could either mean like you've just kind of like, you're not thinking about it or it can mean like you have so much experience that you can go on autopilot, you know? And, uh, I think for me, it's, it's as with everything, it's just sort of about getting the practice and getting the reps. And, you know, when, when you're doing it and kind of like playing by yourself at first, you might encounter, um, some good things that happened and some bad things that happened, you know, for me, for me, some, some good things that happened where I felt like my voice was engaging and people, um, would listen when I sang, Mm -hmm. um, the, some of the bad things that happened were I didn't really feel like I was being a good supportive piano player to my voice. I was having mm. trouble sort of playing in time the way I wanted to play really? or just like having that sort of freedom. Um, and that just takes reps and takes, um, you know, developing your sense of time and, 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 uh, you know, practicing with and without a metronome, uh, uh, list recording yourself and listening back and be- becoming familiar with your tendencies um, and so, yeah, I, I think, I think for me, it, it's just, it's always, I mean, one, one great way to practice, I think is to always just be identifying what your weaknesses are and to kind of dive into how to get better at it. And yeah. it takes, it takes time. Like yeah. it takes, it, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, I, I, don't, I think even if you're like practicing every day at something, it might take might take that some of those experiences of performing or uh, just time for some of that knowledge to seep in um, and so you know being being able to be patient with yourself and you know the good thing was is that I felt as if people were enjoying my performances so 
um, even when I didn't feel like I was sounding my best, it was sort of, it was good enough, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's, that's uh, encouraging on some level. Yeah. Were you, um, and, and forgive me for, for saying it this specific way, but I, I speak from experience for myself, as most artists are. I, you know, I would say a lot, not most, but I think a lot of us musicians specifically can be pretty much unforgiving to ourselves when we want to achieve a specific goal. Like you were saying, you know, we want to, we always want to be improving and figuring out how to do things better. For you, you know, when I watch you perform, I, I see where you're headed and I see the, the artist that you've become and what you're portraying. But I imagine when you first started uh, playing live and being sort of, you know, doing your own solo stuff, Maybe as you were learning piano, maybe things weren't as great as you wanted to, wanted them to be, as you were saying. How forgiving were you on yourself after each performance? And this is obviously another one of those broad questions, and everyone grows differently. Some of us are very forgiving, some of us are not, but I think every legend like yourself kind of has a different way of doing it. So I'm curious for you, like when you first started doing this thing that was semi-different for you, did you sort of allow yourself to learn and, and were you very much pretty chill about it? Like, Oh, it's cool. Or were you very much determined? Like I need to get better if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've always been pretty hard on myself, I think. Um, and, and, uh, not so forgiving. Um, I think I've been pretty unforgiving, uh, towards myself, honestly. Um, and it's, uh, probably something that we all do. I think I, I don't know anybody who's really easy on themselves necessarily. Um, we're our own harshest critics. Um, but it also kind of makes me think about something that also relates to the last question, which is sort of uh, something I think about uh, the intelligence of an audience. I think uh, audiences are extremely intelligent and intuitive about yeah. the mood or uh, uh, the feeling of a performer. And so the minute that, and I've noticed this, when I play and if I get caught up in what I'm doing wrong while I play, I can feel myself begin to partially lose an audience. Interesting. Um, I think the audience like comes to a show to uh, be entertained and to be shown, uh, you know, th the possibilities of right. of the moment, and uh, they don't they don't they don't want to. Uh, gen they don't necessarily don't want to see uh, someone who is pissed off at themselves. You know, yeah. and I don't say that to, I, I don't want to sound like, I think performers should be vulnerable. And I think being vulnerable is probably can be one of your best assets as a performer. Right. But I, but I think like, um, I've just noticed like, it's a very subtle thing. It's like when you're, when you're playing and you have like kind of a frustration with yourself or something, I have noticed myself begin to partially lose an audience. And that that's the kind of vulnerability that that usually doesn't work out, I think. So yeah. um, now that I'm talking, I don't exactly remember how that relates to <laughs> your <laughs> most recent question. Um, no, it totally relates. I was basically asking, you know, how unforgiving or how forgiving you were when you sort of started out playing piano and doing that right. whole thing in front of a live audience. And I asked because... You know, when we look at people that we all admire, like you were mentioning some of the some of your influences in the past and take Stevie Wonder, for example, right? Like we look at him now and you watch him perform. I mean, the man commands a stage. You know, he's just like you were saying, he just oozes experience and, and everyone who watches him knows who he is. But I think all of us who are on the younger side, on our way up, sort of making our way through, you know, making our own path. I think there are going to be many moments that we're going to have frustrations. And I think it's important for a lot of people to understand that, A, I think they're going to happen and it's perfectly fine. But I think it's also important to understand how to deal with them. You know what I mean? And for you, I always watch you play and I, and I see your enjoyment. Like I feel like every time I watch you perform, you're always smiling. 
You know, like I, you always have this grin on your face, but I, learning your story, I realized that there might have been a moment in your past where it wasn't like that. And part of me was wondering, like, okay, was he always smiling? Like when sometimes maybe he played something wrong and, and how did you get to that point where now you're able to like deal with it? Where even right. if you do play a mistake, you're like, you know what? It's fine. You know what I mean? Right. I, I, you know, the, the smiling thing is just something that, that's just you. That that's just me. Like I just feel <laughs> I feel joy when when I get to play my songs and when I get to play music. Um, it's it's just like it's that thing that I feel like I've done since I was a kid, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, as so, I mean, yeah, I that's that's just one hundred percent me. Um, you said, you said so many things just then that made me think of something and now I can't exactly remember what it was. It's all good. um, I tend to to ramble quite a bit, just not like random things. And honestly, like the truth is, I think what you're doing specifically with, with, with uh, your music is I can sense the experience in your music, but I can also sense the growth. You know what I mean? Like when I look at you and when I listen to your music and I watch you play, I see a professional, but I also see someone who is still building his way through. You know what I mean? Like, so right it's, a, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of us and you can feel free to disagree, but, you know, being from L.A. and living the whole L.A. lifestyle every day, you come across a lot of musicians that have high hopes and dreams, a lot of artists that want to be the next biggest thing. And they should be. You know, we're all big dreamers. But I think a lot of solo artists, a lot of artists try to act like they're there. You know what I mean? Like like they, they right. are exactly what they're trying to be. And I think that's perfectly fine. I think there's something like, you know, that whole notion of pretend or fake it until you make it kind of thing. But what you do that's different that I like uh, is what I just mentioned, that I can see the experience and I can see the professionalism, but I can also see that you're trying to make something more. You know what I mean? And I wonder if that vibe or that your approach to music has always been that way. Um, because that's, I believe it takes some humility to be like that, or if you sort of learned it along the way, if that right. makes sense. Well, yeah, maybe it kind of goes back to what I was saying about uh, one of your best assets as a performer is to be vulnerable. And so I, I've learned that by just trying things out at shows, uh, you know, in, instead of playing the same set, um, which even if I do play the same set list, um, it's like building in moments or allowing yourself to to every show to go somewhere unique and to go yeah. somewhere that's um, completely unique to the moment. Um, and for me, I have a few things that kind of um, are built into the set where I can do that. Sometimes it's just like having a conversation with the audience. You know, sometimes it's making up. Uh, a song real quick in the moment or sometimes it's um, I do have in game winner I usually allow myself to um, to speak to sort of make up something either about the town the basket like <laughs> I, I'm a big basketball fan so I'll talk about like if I'm in Portland I'll start singing about the Blazers or, or if you know it's like and so that to me is sort of uh I, it's really it's something that's important to me is kind of like being able to with the audience make something unique in the moment yeah, and i think I, love that. I think uh i don't know i think that's that's been it's it's it usually ends up being like the best part of the night you know it's it does. like it's like in the end you were you're making you're making memories with people and in general like they may remember like that that super crazy high note that you held that was so cool but they also might remember like the time when you accidentally like said something stupid or like <laughs> you know what i mean it's like that's and that's great too and it's about making that moment great and fun also i think yeah no i love that approach because i think myself speaking any any good show i've ever been to any good performance i've ever watched usually has a moment like that you know, a, mo- a very memorable mo- moment where the audience, it doesn't even have to be that the audience is a part of it. Just when you see the personality come through, you know what I mean? Like when you see someone's personality come through a performance, I think that's when it really sticks, in my opinion, because you start to relate to that performer that you're watching. Right you know on. what I mean? And I think it's something that it's, and I'm not, I'm not going to say it's unique to only songwriters. I think it's unique to any performer, but I think there is that vulnerability 
that you have as a songwriter on stage is in a way probably your strongest asset, like you were saying. Absolutely. For me, or at least for me, it is. I mean, listen, there might be there might be some like super, super cool Bradley Cooper uh, <laughs> like dude who's who's like absolutely perfect. And you just go there and you just marvel at how cool they are. But even even being cool can, you know, people who are truly cool. It's like there's vulnerability in there also, you know, True. like the Fonz. The Fonz, <laughs> the Fonz would get vulnerable sometimes. It's true. It's true. Happy days, but there were still some sad days there every, every, now and then. <laughs> every now and then. But Joey, man, thank you so much for being so honest and so open about your craft with me. That's something that I, I just, I love exploring what it is that you do and why it is that you do it so well. And I think it shows you're a very knowledgeable man. You know your music, you know what you're doing, but at the same time, I think you have this openness that a lot of us can learn from sort of being able to embrace our vulnerabilities and just approaching music with this open mind, just just always learning kind of vibe. I think that's why you're successful. I think that's why you're sort of making it, why you're making a difference in the music industry, because you're allowing yourself to do that. And I specifically, I'm learning a lot from talking with you. And I'm hoping that there's a lot of people out there that can learn from that. And I, and like you were saying, I think it depends on the person. It's about understanding who you are, but for you specifically, I think you've learned that that vulnerability and that being openness and, and having that open approach to music works for you and you allow it to work for you. And I encourage everyone to sort of allow themselves to experience multiple things and find what works for them. Ma'am, appreciate, appreciate your, your uh, kind words. I felt like, I felt like a, a beautiful end to uh, like a, re- a religious service. So I was really into that. I, oh I, it's man! My hope that people. It's my hope that that people can uh, can learn from from this podcast, and and uh, I hope it was helpful in any way. Of course, man, Joey. If you had a, if you had a Hammond organ in the background, you should have been playing some chords, man. In the background, <laughs> I was just rambling, giving me some thirteen chords and just just keeping it going. But right Joey, on. man, I mean, to sort of summarize everything, I know we already said everything that we could, but at the end of the of every episode, I sort of just like to give you a quick minute, just to you know, if someone's trying to do what you're doing, they're trying to find themselves or, or trying to find the best way that they can perform or be an artist. And even though we've already said everything, what would you suggest someone that they could be doing right now for them to sort of succeed? Right. Well, I think, you know, something that's been important for me is to just remember that like, uh, music is supposed to be fun. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this whole thing is supposed to be really fun. Um, and connecting with, the things that bring you the most joy, I think, is uh, is really important. And ultimately, that's sort of what this idea of maybe finding your own voice is. Um, you know, finding your voice is is can be a really daunting term. I think. I think really what we're all out here trying to get to is to um, bring some joy into our lives and to other people's lives. And you know, there's an element of working on our craft that isn't always, um, you know, the most like isn't always like a walk in the park, just like we said, like being <laughs> able to look at yourself and, and identify. It takes work. What you, yeah. Identify what you need to get better at and, and being honest with yourself about it and being honest about what kind of work it takes to kind of get um, to get better um, is you know, it's not always a walk in the park, but, um, you know, with that in mind, also making sure that, you know, playing music, um, is, is joyful and makes you happy and brings, if it brings joy into your life, it probably can bring joy in other people's lives. And, and so, uh, I think, you know, especially in like the jazz, uh, the jazz school, realm or even just in this music realm you can come across a lot of uh frowns and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh more often uh you know we we come across smiles and i think um ultimately like that's just feels way better it feels more natural for what we do like music is like how lucky we are to, yeah. to play music you know it's it's really amazing <sighs> I love it, man. How lucky. What a way to, yes, how lucky we are. At the end of the day, 
we could be doing anything else, but we get a chance to actually do what we love. And that's the important takeaway from there. Might as well do it the best way you can and allow yourself to learn from it. Joey, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any new music coming out? Are you working on anything new, any new shows that you have in the horizon? Yeah, I mean, I just I, I just finished a, a year where I put out my first full-length record and I did my first kind of worldwide headlining tour. And uh, I'm back in L.A., now working on some new music and um, kind of plotting the year ahead. I'll, I'll definitely um, be playing some shows. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Still kind of promoting this record that I just dropped three months ago. As you should. It's a great, a great record. I love it. I listen to it quite often, and I, I'm not ashamed to admit right that. It, it's, one, it's one of the great, the greatest ones I have in my playlist. So, Thanks, Joey, dude. thank you so much. Honestly, I can't thank you enough for your time, and uh, I'm wishing you all the best, man. But you don't need any luck. You don't need any luck, because you're doing it already really, really well. Hey, man. Best of luck to you, too. Thanks for having me. Man. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joey. I know that I definitely did. And if some of you guys can tell, I was definitely geeking out a lot in that conversation. And, and frankly, look, there is so much that I could say about this conversation. And, you know, normally here I would give you guys my thoughts. But there really isn't much I can say. There really isn't a lot that I can say that I haven't said before and that Joey didn't express in such an eloquent manner. But the only thing I really just want to make sure that you guys remember, at the end of the day, it's always about doing you and figuring out what's best for you. Joey, his story is interesting because he had to travel basically to the other side of the of the country to figure out a lot of his strengths. And it was a good move for him. But I guarantee you, and this is the similarity with a lot of the guests that I get on the show, you can't really see where something is headed when you make these choices. You know, a lot of the times we make the choices that are best for us at the moment but we don't know where it's going to go. And that's something that I always like to remember and encourage my listeners to keep in mind, as long as you're doing what you love and you have a goal in mind and you're always sort of pushing for that light at the end of the tunnel, no matter where life takes you, you will always be fine. And I'm a firm believer that you know exactly where you need to be. Just listen to your instincts, honestly. And at the end of the day, if you end up doing something remotely close to what makes you happy, then you're definitely on the right path to success. And hey, if you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed this type of conversation, definitely consider subscribing because I do this every week where I do it as much as I possibly can. I bring on some of the coolest musicians to talk to them and really try to understand their mindset. So until next time, guys, keep on doing your thing and I guarantee you, you will find success.